Yeah, welcome to the Clive Barker podcast. Um, today we are Jose. Hi. And I'm Ryan, and we have our very special guest uh, for the second time, uh, Mr. Nicholas Vince. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we just uh, we just I. We just read the book. Um, well, I mean, we've been reading the book for a while. So uh, <laughs> yeah. had a really fun time reading it, What Monsters Do. Okay. So, uh, yeah. yeah, we're looking forward to this conversation. Good, good. So am I. Yes, well, I've just come back from Sheffield oh, today. Oh, yeah. How, how was that? It was good. It was a very late night screening. We mm. didn't fin- we didn't start the Q and A till just <coughs> after midnight, um, right. and so we d- and basically eventually didn't get to bed until around about one thirty. But time we chatted to people. Um, wow. And uh, and so on. And so you know, lots of people came up to the table afterwards and were chatting to us about Cabal. And you know there were it was a nice full audience. It was it was really good fun actually. I had a nice time up in Sheffield. I've not been there before. So that was so, you uh, and Russell, and was Simon there too? It was Russell and Simon. We were at a okay. thing called Celluloid Screams. Ah. Um, it was um, it was really good fun. Uh, in, in, nice nice bunch of people. Really looked after us very well. Um, we w- got to see. The new film Sightseers, um, which was uh, which is their gala opening. Um, which, if you have a chance to go and see it, do. Yeah. it's a, it's a very dark comic film. Um, so this was a film festival then. This was a film festival. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so and we were you know, so they had the gala film opening and then we had the cabal cuts immediately afterwards. So uh, yeah, no, it was good. Um, sold a couple of books whilst I was up there, oh, and great. Uh, yeah, so yeah, it was good. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. So they were chatting with a the chatterer. They were chatting with the chatterer. Yes, <laughs> um, well known for me for me chattering. So yes. <laughs> And today we want to talk about your new book that was uh, that just came out. It's on uh, Amazon. I think you can get the e version or the printed uh, version, and that is what monsters do. Yes, in fact, it's now out on iBooks. <coughs> oh, as is well. it really? Yes, and it's on iBooks. It's on Smashwords. You can get it for any. Uh, e format on Smashwords. Wow. But the um, uh, the paperback is through Amazon. Okay. Uh, via Create Space, uh, yeah, just from Am- any Amazon site now. Uh, it's all up. So it's it's available on all channels. Wonderful. I I read the Kindle version and I have ordered the um, uh, the paperback. Should be coming in any day. So uh, I, I, uh, I ended up. Yeah. Yeah. So that was the one I read. Okay. So um, I guess first let's talk about the cover. Um, you 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 mentioned to us, uh, and we we talked about this in our last episode that that cover is by Carlos Castro. That's right. Yes, who did the um, uh, Night of the uh, Living Dead? Night of the Living Dead in yeah. London. Yeah. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. Yes, for, for Clive, all those many years ago. Um, so Clive, uh, sorry, Carlos and I met in <coughs> San Diego um, back in the 1980s, um, I mean late 1980s. Um, when Clive was there, and it was when I was writing, I was right. It was when, whilst I was writing comics. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, and so just totally delighted, and, and totally delighted that uh, Carlos had agreed. Um, to do a cover for me, um, and he just came up with this wonderful image. Um, yeah, I have to ask: Is it you modeling for the cover as well? I no, mean... it's actually Carlos. Um, oh, okay. it, it's uh, if you look at if you look very carefully because it took me a while to work it work this out. And I was looking at it and I was thinking, hold on, there's a mole under one of the eyes, and I thought. 
That's Carlos. He's used himself. Oh, he <laughs> oh, used okay. himself as the face or as the, the body? Well, it's, it's, it's both him as the face of the book and the person holding the book. Oh, okay. Um, okay. So he, he, he did this in Photoshop. Um, and we'll have, um, a link. we'll have a picture of the cover on the show notes so people can see this. When, when yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yes, and it's Carlos um, who, who, who put it all. Uh, yes, uh, he used him, uh, himself as the model and then just built the whole thing. Oh, cool. So, well, that's um, really, really nice. So, go ahead, sorry. No, I was just going to say it looks really, really nice. I mean, it's a very impressive first yeah. uh, you know, approach. When you pick up the book, you see that. And there's a tagline it's, It is not our flesh, but our acts which make us monsters, which is a mm. wonderful tagline. <laughs> Thank you. And one theme that we that I kind of you know that, that we kind of noticed here is there are a lot of uh, dysfunctional families. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a lot of dysfunctional fraternal relationships. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and somebody else pointed this out. I just suddenly saw. Are there? <laughs> oh yes, I suppose there are really. Well, yeah, this this dysfunctional fraternal. Yeah. Yes, there's at least two very, yeah, three, uh, very dis- dysfunctional fraternal relationships. Um, yes. Uh, in the book, um, I get on very well with my brothers. I should. I have got two brothers. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> uh, I, you know, I get on very very well with them. Um, so I, I don't know. It's it's not anything I was conscious of when I was writing. Um, but those those just came out uh, like that. But I think you know, as you say, the, the tagline, you know, it is our, it is not our flesh. It's a, it is our acts which make us monsters. And what I was interested in is you know, people, or ordinary people in extraordinary circumstances. Um, yes. And how, how people deal with that. Um, so, accepting the Beast in Beauty, uh, how long did it take you to to write these stories? Uh, I started. That was interesting. So, uh, Green Eyes is a story I actually wrote in the 1980s. Oh, really? Originally, yeah. And then uh, I looked at it again, um, and then rewrote it slightly. Um, I've been writing short stories for my own amusement since I, you know, um, since I gave up acting and, and mm-hmm. once I'd stopped doing the comics and so on. Um, yes. So that one particularly is a story that I had written um, uh, really quite early on uh, in, the, in the early years. <laughs> um, so that was a question of reworking that one uh, and looking at it, looking at it again. Um, the others, I suppose, about seven weeks. Okay. Um, and I wish I was maintaining that pace. That pace now. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, what are you working on right now? So, what I'm working on right now is the next volume of short stories. Uh, that's called Other People's Darkness. Mm. All right. Um, that's due out at the end of November. Um, oh, really? Yep. Uh, <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> whether I'm going to make it or not is a really interesting question. But if I, unless I have a deadline of some sort, I'm not. It'll just drift and drift and drift. Um, I'll be sending off um, a cu- at least one short story to the editor, Maria um, Maria Reagan. Um, yes. Uh, sh- I'll, I'll be sending that off this weekend. Um, uh, I'm basically about four weeks behind where I'd hoped to be originally. Mm. Um, but I think because what happened was once I got the first book out, mm-hmm. I realized that that had actually taken a lot out of me. And then, of course, there were other things to concentrate on, like publicizing the first book. Yeah. Um, and that takes energy uh, and time. And then there was just kind of a whole load of practical things to be done. Um, in terms of being self-employed and so on. So um, are the uh, are the so the first book uh, there are two older stories and then the rest were all new. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, okay. So those were completely new. Um, this next volume will be similar, 
that it'll have one reprint. It'll have a reprint of uh, Demon's Design from uh, the Hellbound Hearts. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So oh. I'm re- I'll, I'll reprint that one, and then there are going to be six new stories um, that will. Two of them that I'm working on at the moment. Um, so I'm working on three at the moment. Um, one of which um, is I'm working with Eric Gross from uh, Pyramid. Oh yes. Galleries. Mm-hmm. Um, that one's got a working title of The Shadow Man or The Shadow Man's oh. Laugh. Um, and that, I wrote the first couple of pages and those are probably the, first, probably the most disturbing couple of pages I think I've ever written. Um, <laughs> and, uh, it's a, I'm getting chills. Working on, yeah, and um, then... <clears throat> And I get yeah, so it, 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 it's just you know it's just more short stories. They're, they're quite different. Are they quite different? Yes, they are quite different. I think they're quite different. It's difficult to talk because uh, 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 to be too precise about the new ones because hey, I don't want to give the game away. Yeah, um, we're trying was, not uh, to. We're trying not to do that as well with with. Yeah, the yeah. In talking about the you know, in talking about <clears throat> yeah. about this, but. but um, well, somebody was asking me, um, I was chatting online with somebody the other day, and she was saying, well, where, you know, where do you get your ideas from? I said, well, Green Eyes was literally started one afternoon in Sussex when I was watching snow falling. Um, and I decided I wanted to use the word grunch for the sound of somebody walking across snow. I noticed that. I highlighted that word on my Kindle <laughs> book. And it's actually put in italics in, in the book. And I, I thought, is this a neologism or something? And I was like, yeah, this, this word perfectly describes the noise that makes when you walk on snow. <laughs> yeah. So I enjoy yeah. that. Oh, good. Thank you very much, because it, it was just that... Because it was, you know, it was in Sussex and it was snowing quite heavily. And I thought, it's not a crunch, it's not a cut sound, it's a, you know, it's a grunge. Um, yeah. Something more soapy about it. Um, yeah. I spend a lot world. of time walking on snow. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you do, don't you? <laughs> in Alaska. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so that's where that one came from. Um, and, it, and then it just... And I was sitting in my parents' house in Sussex, which is nothing like the house I describe uh, in the book, but is similar to friends' houses I had down in Arundel. Um, so kind of combining different friends' houses. Um, and then, you know, and it's kind of the, the, the idea of the, the people with green eyes and the mm. cat and... Yeah. Uh, and so I'm sitting in front of log fires. Um, that that story um, that story kind of caught me uh, at first. I mean, and, and Jose and I were talking about this before uh, before we got started. Um, he was talking about the cat, and and he seemed kind of affectionate with the cat. And then and then I threw the cat in the fire. And, yeah. And 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 uh, we both admitted that that you know that that caught both of us off guard. Of course, it was just in his mind. He didn't really throw the cat in the fire. Yeah, it was just a flash of <clears throat> showing his thought process, yeah. showing his haunting images that would flash in his head, in Justinian's head. Yeah. But I, I admit, I was caught off guard on that moment as well. And mm. uh, I was like, oh, oh, that was surprising. Okay, let's see what comes out of it. <laughs> it, so, uh, it made me think, you know, I think sometimes yeah. you always get these weird impulses, uh, to do things that you know would be wrong or, or you know, not... Uh, yes, yeah. something that would Edgar Poe would describe as the imp of the perverse, I think. Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. Yes, spot on. Absolutely. Um, of course, uh, we find out that this guy is not, you know, they're not just, you know, that, but... He, he, yes, he's, he's not, he's not really that nice. Um, it, it was interesting. I think the... Um, I was watching TV. Now, I don't know if... Uh, it, it's, it was a program made in 2011 for the Discovery Channel by mm. Eli Roth, 
where he was talking, um, and it's called How Evil Are You? Um, uh -huh. And he was talking to the psychologist, the, the doctor, I can't remember, but, it, but this psychologist has um, appeared on Criminal Minds because he's examined the brain of yes. psychopaths um, and can show what parts of the brain respond with empathy. Um, and in people with psycho psychoses, they don't respond with empathy, and you can see it on a brain scan. Um, mm. And it was interesting because he was doing the Milgram experiment. Um, oh, yes. Wh the, the, the one the where they... experiments? No, oh, not no, the, the one. I know, the one where they pretend they're shocking someone on the That's other side right. of the window. Yes. Yes, yeah. In the 1960s, they seem to be, or 1950s and 60s, they seem to be able to get away with an awful lot more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, well, you're doing so, yes, because the, 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 yeah, the, the thing about the shock um, and just how far in people being um, controlled. Because it's the, and it was fascinating, of course, is that you know, by carrying out the, they, I think Milgram did about a thousand odd people for the TV program. I think they probably did about a dozen or so. Um, and he, you know, Milgram was saying, well, just how easy is it? to find people to work in death camps. Um, oh, yeah, the Sonder Commandos? Yes. Yeah. And, and, and how easy is it? If you give somebody a person in authority, how willing will be people, how willing are people to say, okay, just to go along with it, just because there's somebody else saying this. Yes, because it, um, to some extent it relieves them of the... Uh, moral decision, of the burden of moral decision, and they say, well, I was just following orders, so... Yeah. Yes, precisely, yes, and then there's a, there's a very telling moment in the in the Eli Roth program where um, they ask the person, the subject of the person who's actually been applying the shocks, okay, well, you stopped, but whose fault was this? Whose responsibility was this? Mm. And one woman, he just immediately said, it was him. You know, it's not me, it's him. Um, yes. Other people were, no, this is my responsibility, um, which I thought was heartening. Um, it, it's a very, if you can catch it, as I say, it's a Discovery Channel. It's, it's available in the UK at the moment on demand. Um, it's a very interesting program, uh, very yes, interesting it, program. From what I remember, it was... Um from a show called Curiosity, I think. That's right, yes. Yes. Yes, I, yes. I think I've seen that, um, that, that program with Eli Roth. At least I remember watching it partially. <clears throat> so, yes, it was Curiosity from the Discovery Channel. Hmm. That's right, and, uh, yes. Yep, yeah, no, absolutely spot on. So but, um, um, this this other story, death is the door is but the doorway. Uh, mm. There was a lot of uh, it seemed like there was a lot of uh, research into Egyptian mythology for this one. Yes, uh, that, that one was really lucky. I mean, um, I guess, again, funnily enough, that one sprang out of a short story, not a short story as such, but ideas for a four-page comic script. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. And the two, and the central character of Judith and her nan. Um, it was those two characters who really interested me, and um, I'd written a four-page, which was to do with Egyptian. Um, and then, when I came back to writing, I happened to be up near Leicester um, and walked. Um, it was because Craig, my partner, was doing a, cook, a cookery course, um, and he had a, a whole day cookery course, um, and I was left by, to my own devices. I wandered into a museum. It's, just a, it's a really small museum, and they had half a dozen Egyptian mummies on show. Uh -huh. um, it, was re it was just like, oh, wow, well, I've just got all my reference and research material right here in front of me. Um, so I spent about an hour or so um, 
uh, in that museum, looking at the mummies, reading all the stuff that they put on, um, describing all the beliefs and so on. Um, and the I kind of want you to. And... Yeah, Book of the Dead and, and, and the whole process and, you know, the amulets and the, the things that were put in the coffin, in, in, in the uh, sarcophagus, sarcophagi. Um, and it, it kind of just took off from there. Um, so I did, did my research. I spent, I spent that afternoon uh, in the museum uh, doing that. And then... Um, did an awful lot of online research uh, as well. So, um, so when you were there at the museum, it, <clears throat> did it kind of make you wonder, you know, these people believe in this kind of an afterlife, and what does it mean when you're, you know, taking their their corpses and dragging them around the world, you know, and displaying them? Yes, absolutely. I think you know, obviously um, what, uh, what inspired me and what I went out and watched immediately as well it was the Boris Karloff mummy. Mm. Um, and I, I think that's a wonderful movie. Um, I also like the original, the, the, you know, the first of the Brendan Fraser uh, mummy. Uh-huh. mummy. Um, and Clive, of course, Clive Barker was asked to write a mummy yeah. movie <clears throat> by Universal he, on one stage. But I think it basically his pre- that. Yeah, yeah we, I mean, because we did discuss that. It was it was supposed to be a story about um, um, there would be a diorama set in in place in a museum, and then there would be like the, this uh, this beautiful woman, and you know. Uh, well, anyway, we discussed that before, so I'm going to let you continue. Yeah, I, I think you know. My understanding was that obviously Clive's treatment was probably too gory. It was more yeah. horror than a family entertainment. And obviously, mm-hmm. what they, you know, what Universal were interested in doing with the franchise was a, was make it into more family thing. Um, but I, I've always been I've always been fascinated by Egyptology. Anyway, um, when I was. Well, gosh, back in the 1960s, the you know the Tutankhamun exhibition mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. came to came to London, um, and I remember we queued for nearly eight hours wow. to get into the British Museum, me and my family. Um, and I remember <laughs> queued for eight hours. You're only in the exhibition for about 20 minutes or so, um, but wow. I remember I remember standing in front of the the mask of Tutankhamun, um, uh, and that, that having a profound effect on me as a, as a child, just it is incredibly beautiful. And I think it's trying to get your head around the idea that this thing that you're looking at is over 2,000 years old. Yes. Um, that time scale, and it's just a really fascinating belief system. Um, it does. It does remind you of the na- famous Napoleon quote, which is, "From the top of these pyramids, forty centuries are looking back at you." So, to some uh, extent, yes. mm. yeah. I've not heard. I've, I've not heard that one, but I, 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 yeah, I can, you know, um, completely understand. Uh, one of the characters in this story. Um, a Judith, or <clears throat> as she would prefer to be called, Jude. Mm. Um, <laughs> she kind of reminded me a little bit of the um, the girl from the Dragon Tattoo character, um, because she's this strong, strong. At, at the same time, very fragile. She still lives with her nan, you know, but she has this mohawk, three spiked mohawk. She dresses like a gothic chick, and she is really smart in terms of she's one of the experts in her field of egyptology and mm. this dynasty and, and all that so that reminded me a little bit of, of that character it's one of those characters which is very strong at the same time a little vulnerable you still can relate to some parts of her personality so um i, I was very surprised at the story uh especially in the beginning when they're in the uh, the she she's with harry which is mm. another another um uh, expert in Egyptology, and they're inside this house, and they discover uh, basically a pharaoh's tomb. And uh, and I was like, why is this in London? And that kind of threw me off a little bit. But then as the story progressed, it absolutely made sense. All the pieces fell into place. And 
that was a wonderful twist ending, and I was very, very, very uh, entertained by this story because it. Re- I, I I enjoyed especially the fact that we would be um, that gods might be um, actual stories of real existing entities that somehow fell into myth. And, uh, and and then there's there must be, if you follow the thread, eventually back in time, that you might find actually someone who started all that. And um, that was very, very surprising for me. It was interesting to pick up. I was, you seem to have picked up on about two or three things there. Um, I mean, we're not giving the, the game away when we say that Harry dies in this story because it's the first line of the story. Mm. Um, the... I think it's also interesting you're talking about um, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Um, I did, I've listened to those books. Uh, as I say, it was, it was based on the two, those two characters of Jude and her nan. They were written in the 1980s, a long time before Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Right. Um, I'd seen the movie recently. I can't tell you if I saw it before or after I wrote the story. But I'm also I'm kind of interested in um, uh, writing strong female characters. Um, I find nothing more depressing than bimbos covered in blood being chased by monsters. Um, they trip and well, fall. It, it, yeah, it's kind absolutely. of it's kind of aggravating when they ha- you know when they have to look up to the men you know to solve their problems for them. Yeah, and that just, uh, it's like, I just find it you know disrespectful to women. Mm-hmm. Um, um, so I think I'm my character you know the, the female characters that I, I want to write and I'm interested in um, are. Different, you know. That's not to say that you know that one of the characters in Shadow Man is the mother, and she's not a strong character. Um, yeah, she's definitely not a strong character. Um, but, you know, men, women, we've all got our failings and so on. What I'm trying to do, obviously, I think, like all authors, we're trying to write something that is um, as truthful as possible. Um, yes. So uh, she was always a very, you know, the dude in, in my mind very clearly is a very strong, but a, a very strong but caring character as well, and fun. Yeah, I wanted her to be fun. Um, she, you know, she's kind of disrespectful, and she's her own woman. She's definitely her own. Oh yes, woman. yeah, yes. Uh, uh, and I think it's, it's someone. Mm, yeah, go on. Well, I was going to say the other thing you picked up in the the, the Egyptian thing, which I think is part of the, what the story is about, is the importance of names. Um, mm-hmm. And again, that's something that I got from the museum, is that having your name is part of being immortal. Um, oh, yes. Your name your name being, you know, this is because if you study your Egyptology and, yeah. and so on, if a, if a pharaoh was unpopular afterwards, they went around and removed all the cartouches. Um, and the idea of people, you know, the, the people we think of as gods as being mythological, this is found in quite a few, um, in Mexico, funnily enough, um, there is, I can't remember the name, um, but they have found that the original, you know, the people who become referred to as gods and mythical creatures, they found the bones, they found the original um, a tomb of the original historical person on which the stories are based. And I think that, you know, that's what we all know about myths and legends, is that there is some sort of truth. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. And, and, and the historical character. And, and, and names are so very important. That's why they created those huge tombs. And if I may quote one of my favorite uh, English artist, which is Banksy. I mean, he has a wonderful quote about that, which is, I mean, when they say you die twice, one time when you stop breathing, and a second time a bit later on when someone says your name for the last time. Mm. So, I always, I always enjoy this quote very much, even, you know. Yes. 
Yeah, so uh, that, that's very true, isn't it? Yes, when and, I, and and as human beings, I think we all want to be remembered. We, you know, that's why people have gravestones. Um, sure. Yeah, that's a very, very broad generalization as why people have gravestones, but that's part of the reason. Is yeah. you, you, uh, you, you, your grave marker um, is, is is part of that type of immort, you know, desire for immortality, if you like. Yeah, I guess whether you believe in an afterlife or not, everybody wants to at least leave their mark here, even if it's just to make the world a better place or, you know, yep. s spread some love around and uh, and leave behind the world a little better than when you found it and a more a people with a bigger smile on their face. I mean, that, yeah. that should be everybody's goal. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. And I think, but also I think for artists and creators, um, as well, you also want the work to speak as well. I, I think that's the other thing, the fascinating thing about writers, actors, artists, sculptors. Is, you know, there is that other form of you know, immortality um, that the, you kind of want. You want the work to stand um, for something so that other people. Um, one of the great delights, we were talking about this last night, uh, Simon and I, when we were on stage with Russell, is that Hellraiser still stands um, 25 years later. It's gaining new fans. People find resonances within that movie even now. Mm -hmm. um, and that's absolutely fascinating. Um, Cabal has got it, the Nightbreed has got its new life with the Cabal cut. Um, and again, so there's so many different aspects to what we do, but also as an artist, you know, I want my nephews and nieces to remember me very fondly when I'm gone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, not, not just as a, the odd aunt, uncle who does monster movies and stories and so on. Um, but just as, you know, who was a very nice guy, I remember him and, and, we all want to teach children something. Absolutely, we all we all want to make you know the world a better place. Mm. Uh, that's why that's why the um, the book has that quote, which is, "It's not our flesh, but our acts, which makes us monsters." And the opposite is also true. It's it is not our flesh, but it's our acts that can make us saints or heroes. Mm. Yeah, and yes. um, so that works both ways. But this quote, I must say, is is. A bit inaccurate for the first story because actually in the first story it is his own flesh that makes him a monster for that character in um, family, um, tree. family tree right I mean there was a curse yeah and uh, yeah kind of, I think the story is a bit more about mm, interesting I don't but this is I think this is this, and I think this is my fascination with monsters. Um, I've been interested in monsters for as long as I can remember. I think I've told you guys before about the fact that I used to have the, you know, when I came to see the, the Universal uh, monsters. But read ghost stories before I read that, um, and so on. Um, the strange, the, you know, the, the bizarre. The people who look different. Um, it's how we judge them sometimes, which is kind of mm -hmm. the theme of Cabal. Yeah. Uh, the monsters get sent away. Um, and I, uh, actually something else that came out, that came out of the conversation we were talking about last night, um, when I was talking after the movie to, because somebody had brought along the Nightbreed Chronicles. Um, and in the Nightbreed Chronicles, Clive explains that Kinski wasn't was ugly to begin with took the st vincent dissolution to make himself yeah. beautiful um and eventually ends up in midian because of his looks but unlike peliquin he isn't a supernatural being yeah yes he was made that way he, 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 yes, he, he, he's found a home in Midian, but actually he's a natural. 
Except right. I think that he's old, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that was in the 1800s when he did that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he, 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 yeah he's, he's, he's become supernatural and he's in the 1800s and yeah. he's obviously become immortal. He's taken on that. Yeah, you're absolutely right. But he started off as natural. Yeah. And in many ways, he is still... Yeah, no, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good point. Um, well, and as you read well, the it, Nightbreed it, Chronicles, there are a lot of the a lot of the um, the so-called monsters in there are really people who went through some kind of a transformative event that kind of turned them into freaks. Well, yes. uh, Clive's transformations—I mean, his characters when they undergo transformations—it's like the other side of the coin from when you look at a Cronenberg film, which is in Cronenberg's films the transformations are always very. Um, very uh it, it very destructive they just dis- disrupt the, the the person they turn him into a monster but in clive's work the transformation that his characters go through even though they might become monstrous it's always a liberation and uh mm, a kind mm. of enlightenment i think yeah. i mean it's even from the the story the madonna for imagica you know all those night breed it always is like something deep inside is released and that causes a transformation. And it's not a degradation of their own flesh or their spirit. It becomes like a transition into something higher, superior. So that's mm. what I always felt about uh, Clive, Clive's transformations and, you know, the, the characters that are in his stories. Even with Hellraiser, I mean, at least, you know, in, in Nightbreed for Kinski, at least we can say St. Vito's dissolution <clears throat> did its work because he now looks much better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just not what he was hoping for. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. It was great that he managed to get some work for McDonald's, though. Yes. <laughs> yeah, somewhere I have the Mac tonight to figure out know, something to study, in fact, yeah. um, as we, we mentioned before. Yeah. But you're, you're absolutely right. In the, in the first, in the first story, um, without wanting to give too much away, this is definitely. Uh, it, well, it's, a very, it's a classic. It, it, it's one of my. It's my take on, on one of the classic monsters, which is one of the. Yes, you know, is one of the things I wanted to do was start. You know, is is there something new to write about the classic monsters? Well, um, and I, I, I have to say, I love the way that, without giving it away, I love the way that. Uh, and Jose and I were talking about this. The the way that the monster transforms uh, from yes. from a person into a werewolf. Mm. Yeah, I, I yeah. do. I do yeah. believe you managed to add in something new to the yeah. to the character, to the monster, uh, especially the way that he would have to. I, I'm not going to spoil it, but he would have to do something and then you know put it back uh, after he was transforming. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it, I really it, it, enjoy that that detail and the yeah. scars on its you know body. That that was perfectly explained, and that was uh, a quite pleasurable to read that new take on it there, thank you there was a um, there was a, f- a foreign movie and i'm trying to remember what it was called um two girls that became werewolves uh, i don't know ginger it. ginger snaps i think it is oh no i've not heard of this one uh, at all and i i thought that one was really interesting because their take on the werewolves was that it was a a gradual transformation that was permanent so they start mm. out as human, and they get you know more and more traits of a werewolf as they. You know. Oh, interesting! Yeah, I, so, just, I just discovered that on the IMDb. It's uh, Ginger Snaps, two thousand. Uh, this film uses werewolfism as a werewolfism <laughs> as a metaphor for puberty. One of the Fitzgerald sisters, suburban goth girl outcast, gets bitten by something in the woods, and then you know things go from there. So um, interesting. I, I'll give that one a. A watch, mm. and, and mm. I think American Werewolf in London is another one where um, the traditional take on the werewolf was kind of put into question, and and I think that made it that made it a good partly made it a good movie. Oh yeah, well, yeah, well, I'm, and, and of course, actually, that was one of the inspirations for writing the, the story. Um, the American Werewolf in London was definitely an inspiration. Uh, again, not wanting. To, we're going to. We we definitely given. We there are. We we need to put up a spoiler alert at the beginning of this <laughs> yeah. podcast. I yeah. think it's like well, there you go. the podcast after you've read the story yeah. is, is is my recommendation. Yeah. Um, but the again before I wrote that story, I went back and I watched the original. Um, 
the Universal, uh, the Lon Chaney Jr. Mm -hmm. Wolfman, uh, yes. Wolfman. Um, Actually, it was really nice because uh, afterwards I wrote, I watched uh, after this has been published. Uh, literally, in, within the last uh, couple of weeks or so, I've seen the more recent, the Benicio del Toro, Wolfman, which I think is just brilliant. Um, uh -huh. With uh, really, Anthony Hopkins. With Anthony Hopkins, yeah. um, I really thoroughly enjoyed that movie. Um, I think that movie got a bad. Uh, it got a bad rep because I think the critics didn't like it very much. They kind of panned it a bit. But I also had a lot of fun watching it. I thought, you know, uh, Rick uh, Baker's uh, Wolfman was, was amazing. And uh, mm. the, transformation, the, the transformation being made from a, a private setting into a public setting in front of an amphitheater it was just a brilliant move for the story and of course uh, you get you get a werewolf loose in the streets of london which yeah. is always uh, a wonderful thing to you can do so many things with a werewolf loose in london so yeah. i also enjoy that movie very much and of course anthony hopkins is a werewolf i mean really <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but you know, talking about difficult family relationships. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Again, without wanting to spoil, if you have, if you've not seen it, recommend going seeing it. The other, and of course, the other great werewolf movie that I saw recently was, um, oh, the Spanish one, Game of Werewolves. Um, uh, where, uh, Spanish, but, Spanish werewolf but, movie. Yes, uh, literally just come out in the last month of mm. month or so. Oh, um, okay. Ah, crikey. It should be on iTunes. Um, in fact, I watched it on iTunes. Um, what's it called? We'll have to, I'll look it up for you. Um, Roma Santa? To... No, that's, that's not the one. The Game of Werewolves? No. Okay, not Game of Werewolves. It was based, somebody was saying it was actually based on um, a video game, but it's uh, iTunes uh, film. We'll carry on talking. Okay. I'll, I should be able to do this in, in sure. the background. Well, I think um, I can just edit this one, part out. Uh, another one that I have a soft spot for is is The Howling, and I know that it hasn't aged well, but I I just love the way that those werewolves look. They're all tall and gangly and like ten feet tall. Yeah, yeah. I I I like the um, the other one, the not the American Werewolf in London, but the one that takes place in Paris. Uh, that that yeah. for me is pretty. Uh, American Werewolf pretty, in Paris. Yes, because you get yeah, these, which is a sequel. Yeah, I, I've not seen yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, you haven't seen it? That's wonderful. No, no, I have I'm, not. All these French muscly guys turning into werewolves and clubbing in Paris. It's just amazing. What's it called again? American uh, Werewolf in Paris. American Werewolf in Paris, yeah. okay. I shall check that one out. Yeah, the werewolves are really, really badass. I mean, the French werewolves are badass. Mm. Because there are these muscle guys with shaved heads, and they, they turn into werewolves. And they have these gangs in Paris. And they all of a sudden, they just start, you know, clubbing inside, like, really seedy nightclubs in Paris. Mm. And it's just crazy. I mean, that movie's just crazy. I'll have to give it it's a really chance. Fun... I, didn't, I didn't like it, I think, because it wasn't as much like American Werewolf in London. Yeah, maybe you have the first one in your head, and yeah. it was you were kind of comparing it to it. Yeah. But this one is really fun. I mean, uh, and and there's like people bungee jumping from the Eiffel Tower. It's that, just that's crazy. what I remember the most. <laughs> yeah. Oh right. Oh, I, I shall have to check this out. I'll have to see if I can get it on iTunes and and, uh, and check it out. I'm not getting this Werewolf movie that I've watched recently that I can't because um, it's not coming up on iTunes easily. I will. I'll have to look this up. Um, and drop you a note with this, so you can you can bung it on at the end or put it on the. Um... No problem. In the in the late eighties, there was a TV show that was a werewolf show, and I can't remember what it was called. It, it, is it was it like a cartoon or with live no, action? No, no, it was live action. I loved that show oh. when I was a kid, and I'm trying to remember. Really? Oh. oh, I remember watching Teen Wolf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Teen Wolf. Was, yeah, Teen Wolf. <laughs> I think the first werewolf movie that I ever saw might have been. Uh, the, that one that we mentioned a while ago, the one that where they're all having a banquet and the guests start turning into werewolves. Compa uh, Company of Wolves. Company of oh, Wolves. Oh no, sorry. Um, 
oh, werewolves were everybody having a banquet, and I'm, think, I'm getting confused with vampires. It's so, it's so easy to do that. Um, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah I, I can't, at the moment, I have no ideas about writing a story for a vampire. If I can come up with an idea of something new uh, mm. for vampires, yeah. I will do. But I don't see myself doing it at the moment, I have to say. Yeah. It's pretty saturated, um, I think, <laughs> at the time. Well, yeah, yeah, I kind of think we're probably, you know, it, it's... Um, it's interesting, you know, we've, we've now in, and so many zombies. Um, <laughs> yeah. Although, yeah. One, zombies one film, are also saturated. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes, zombies are also saturated. I was going to say, one of the films that's been going the rounds with the um, uh, film festivals in the UK is um, Cockneys vs. Zombies, uh, which is getting a, <laughs> uh, it's a, it's, uh, a very... He's getting good, strong reactions. Um, huh. I really hmm. want to go out and see that. Is it going to be kind um, of like Shaun of the Dead, maybe? Or? Yeah, yeah. I think probably, from what I understand, um, definitely uh, that kind of um, yeah. that kind of thing. Would it have Chav zombies? <laughs> I, don't, I haven't seen it to be able to sit, to to be able yeah. to tell you um, so because it's, it's, it's not I, it, it's not um, it's not on release yet. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see. Well, and when Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter came out, they, they, I saw an advertisement for oh, you should also see Abraham Lincoln Zombie Hunter. It's like really, really yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Barbie was asking about uh, Abraham uh, Lincoln um, Vampire Hunter. I saw it the other day. I'm not completely convinced by it. Um, it's kind of fun, but and I wondered if it would make more mean more to Americans than it would to us. Um, I haven't seen it. I'll have to. I have to check it out. Probably, yeah. yeah. But you yeah. know, there's this wonderful movie uh, with Daniel Day Lewis coming out where he's going to play Abraham Lincoln. And I'm just bracing myself for the inevitable onslaught of comments on IMDb saying, this sequel to Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter sucks. Because <laughs> 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 I'm sure there'll be someone who yeah. goes to watch that movie and then they're yeah. going to start making snarky jokes about uh, Daniel Day Lewis didn't fight any vampires in this movie. Yeah. What's the deal? Yeah, with that? yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, we. Um, Anyway, so <clears throat> that covers, um, uh, we're almost halfway, I guess. We mentioned Family Tree, Tunes from the Music Hall. Um, mm. Tunes from the Music Hall was, I, I would like to say this first, which is this, uh, this short story, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> which I think this won't spoil a lot because this gets explained in the first page or couple of pages. Mm. It's... It's uh, a narration from the point of view of a spirit. And mm. I was kind of reminded from the old, you know, uh, Montague Rhodes James stories or Sheridan Le Fanu stories, like the ghost of Mrs. Crowell and stuff like that. Mm. Because ghosts will, it, it's a story where ghosts get involved in a kind of a family life. Mm. And, and also uh, the ending reminded me, and I'm not going to say the ending, but the ending reminded me of Thou Art the Man from Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, because of the, oh, the I don't visual. know that story. Oh, you don't? No, it's not in my. I don't think because the the one I have up on the shelves. I don't. I don't know that Edgar Allan story. Edgar, oh, Edgar, it, Edgar Allan Poe story. It's great. It also has to do with um, uh, someone commits a crime and then someone is dead, and even from beyond the grave, they are able to point out. Something. I'm not. I'm not right. trying to. Sure, you. sure, yeah. sure. So I have. I have. Uh, geez, I have the the works of Edgar Allan Poe. I'm a complete Poe addict. To uh, right. So um, yeah, I really enjoy this story because there's two two subplots. Of course, there's the the, the story of how the spirit came to be in that house and what happened to mm -hmm. him, and there's a story of the family that moves in. And you know, I, I was. This was. This is my second most favorite story of the book. Uh, okay. The first being uh, the the Beast and Beauty, and then it's this one. So right. I was. I, was, I enjoy this one very much. Oh, thank you. Oh, good. It was fun to write. 
Um, and again, it was a, a, it kind of came from an idea that I've uh, had for a long time. Um, and this is kind of a spoiler. Well, well, I mean, the inspiration is the movie Gaslight. Um, with, in fact, I watched two versions of uh, the movie Gaslight. Do you know it? No. Um, I think so. It's. It, I'm trying to. It's not the one with uh, with Lon Chaney that was lost, right? No, no. Obviously, it's not. No, 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 no. There, the, 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 there were two versions of the movie Gaslight. And I'll, I'll have to bring it up on IMDb to actually give you the right. The, the right um, uh, sorry, that's my phone making blooping noises to tell me that somebody's just retweeted something. Oh, they've just retweeted the fact we're doing this this podcast. Yay! Um, <laughs> yay! Yeah. Oh, yay! Right. Yay. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Man, it's the movie, right? Yes. Oh. Yes. Okay. Now, that's okay. the second version. Um, it was actually a stage <laughs> play. Um, it was done... Um, with Vincent Price on stage. Um, and I wanted to write something in, set in that uh, uh, era. Um, and it was interesting because the... Um, yes, right, there we are. Yes, because it was actually originally... It was done in 1940 with Anton Walbrook uh, and Diana Wingard. And then in 1944 with Charles Boyer and Ingrid Bergman. Now, we talk about remakes happening quickly these days. Literally within four years of it, they'd remade it. Wow. Oh. Um, so the English, the, the Gaslight, the 1940 version was an English production with English actors and done over here, and then they Hollywoodized it. Um, Bergman, I think, got... Let me just check on oh, IMDb. I'm wondering if she got... I think she might have got... I think this was her first Oscar. Um, so it's really... I, I, it, it's a fascinating... The story that I've written is a nod the film, to Gasly. Okay. I was just looking. The film was nominated for seven Oscars. Uh-huh. Um, Best Picture, Best Actress for Ingrid Bergman, Best Actor for Charles Boyer, Best Supporting Actress for Angela Lansbury, uh, mm. Best Adapted Screenplay, Best Art, Art Direction in Black and White, and Best Cinematography. So, and uh, and it won for the Actress and Art Direction. Yes. Yes. So this is this is Bergman getting her her Oscar. Um, that is very interesting. Um, and again, that is what I watched those, t both of those, um, I watched before writing the story, uh, uh -huh. just to give myself, uh, it, it was, it was just something, um, that I, I I wanted to write something written in that period with gaslight and fog and London and then that time um, and writing about you know the the, the musical because I grew up on musical um, uh -huh. in terms of, we used to have a TV series uh, on in the UK called the good old days um, which was a recreation of an Edwardian musical it used to, you know it was a variety show basically um, lots of songs and so on, um, and I wanted to write something uh, kind of set in that era for for a while. And it does immediately transport you into that yeah. black and white. I actually, when I was visualizing the story, I was visualizing it in black and white. I mean, I don't know. If that, it's, I know it's uh, it's kind of strange, and and I, well, I think for it, some people reason people in those days it, saw in black and white, didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think. It, Mm. <laughs> no, I was just going to say that for some reason I kept visualizing the Phantom as Eric from Phantom of the Opera, but if, obviously he's much better looking than that. Yeah, yeah. 
I mean, it, it's interesting, but I, I can completely understand. In that case, I don't, you know, I've got it right. If you're seeing it in black and white, perhaps <laughs> well, that yes. came through from the inspirational <laughs> material, because obviously well, yes. both those films are done in black and white. Um, and I, I completely understand what you're saying. You know, the, the world was black and white in those days. <laughs> um, I, I've, heard, yeah. I, I've, I've actually that. heard that comment uh, where a, ki- a, a kid actually believed that. Well, well it comes first, from Calvin. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say it, it comes. Calvin, it, it's one of the gags in Calvin and Hobbes, uh, uh, yes. of course. <laughs> exactly. that, uh, his, his father convinces Calvin that up until a particular stage, um, the world was black and white. That's why the movies <laughs> are like that. Um, yeah. But you know, you just read the first line from the story, which is, "It was a dark, damp, and foggy afternoon in London," and you're immediately there. I mean, it's just <laughs> like. It, you just look around your shoulder and, oh, there's a guy in a top hat and a coat. And yeah. There's a coach yeah. going by. And there's Bella Lugosi seducing a little flower girl. And, you know, yeah. immediately there. Yeah. Yeah. So that works. Yeah. So, yes, I mean, uh, beautiful looking ghost inhabiting a, mm. a house. And the family yeah. comes in. And uh, we really start getting, identifying with the spirit. And then, like I said, I really enjoy the uh, juxtaposition of the two stories. Yeah. What the ghost good. Uh, experience plus what the uh, family is experiencing. Mm. So, very, very entertaining. My second favorite, most favorite story in the book. So, yeah. your first oh, is, you. is your first uh, The Beast and Beauty? Yes, the first one was The Beast and Beauty. Yeah, I, I have to admit. Um, I did read it before I got the book because it it came out in Amazon first as a separate story. Yes. yes. Uh, and immediately I, I, I purchased it through Kindle uh, Cloud, Amazon Cloud Reader, I think. So I read that story. It really stuck with me. And then I read the book, read the story again for this podcast episode, and it just confirmed my impression of the story. It's just, it's just brilliant. I really enjoyed it. Good. Good. <laughs> so The Beast and Beauty... Um, was this I, this was my I, this was my first time reading it was you know at the end of this book so um mm. i i don't have as much time and experience with it as Jose, but uh this the ceremony that they did and the police called it satanic did they really mm. was it really that or was it just that they didn't understand what they were seeing uh, or is this just an excuse for people to take their clothes off have sex in the middle of Hampstead Heath and um, and so on. Yeah. It was, when I, what I do remember when writing that story originally is because um, there's a description of um, the, the satyr and how he gets born, which I'd taken from ancient myths that yes. this is how satyrs came into the world. They came from eggs. Well, it was um, a really big egg, wasn't it? A really, really big egg, yeah. and I have no idea where they found that egg. Um, uh, and their father was uh, Salinas. Yeah. So that was the father of the satyrs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but, I, you know, it, like all myths, you you can there are different versions of myths, and depending on which part of Egypt or in, uh, in Greece in this case, uh, you'll get a different, you know, you'll get a different story. And of course, different towns have their own gods and doing competition yeah. and they want their temple to be bigger than everybody else's because they want to get the more tourists in to see their temples so they can get their money, um, which is, you know, how stories get told and, and so on. But um, I do remember cracking open an egg and seeing what flame looks like from the inside uh, of an eggshell. Um, just got to, got to get that part right. Hmm. But, I mean, again, that was... I, I, you know, I'm very fond of that story, um, and which is why I wanted to put it back in the collection. Um, the reason it got published originally <coughs> as a standalone was because I, because I, I wanted to technically find out how all this stuff worked. Um, before I did before I did the collection of short stories, um, well, it was a good way of just finding how to get all oh, stuff on yeah, the board yeah. and so on, and doing the, you know the sheer practicality of it. Um, and it was you know it's inspired by a John Bolton mm-hmm. painting, um, which is going back to Green Eyes. Um, 
that is also, as I say, I, I first started writing that story, um, watching Snowfall, um, and so on, and wanting to use the word grunge. Um, but there is a picture called We Must Always Turn South, um, which is which inspired one of the scenes in that story. Um, I get inspired by pictures a lot, um, and I have postcards on my notice board at home, which I know are going to give me scenes um, and inspirations for stories. Because the moment I see a picture, if it's a figurative picture, I immediately start thinking of the story behind it. Mm. What is it that led up to that point? What happens afterwards? Um, so go, like, there's a lot of my inspiration from yeah. pictures. And this, this almost uh, as if. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, almost as if on the other side of the of the picture, it's like a different world, and that whole world has its own story and its own myths and uh, yeah. I guess well, you know, it's well like... yeah I mean which is effectively you're talking about Alice through the looking glass yeah, um, yeah. and yes you're, you know the, these characters that an artist has created um, or a, a sculptor if I'm looking at a sculpture um, <coughs> the, the there are stories there you know the, the, a picture any picture is a moment in time. Um, there has to be a before. There has to be an after. Something has got to be populated. And this, um, this John Bolton painting uh, looks like it's pretty timeless. Like, I mean, it could take place at any in any age in any. Uh, mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think it, it, you know, um, back in the 1990s when John did the. Um, uh, the original picture, and it wasn't for, it was just something that had come into his head. Hmm. Um, uh, and you, you can see the, the picture on my website. Um, the dress that he's put, he puts the girl in is kind of timeless. It's just a very, very simple dress. Yeah. Um, something quite modern about it. And it also kind of, in a way, it almost blends into this, the, the ground. Hmm. Yes, yeah, but, you know, she's very much part of the woods yeah. and very much part of that. If I can uh, mention what Ryan picked up, uh, the first thing that he asked, like, well, were the police really thinking that this was a Satanist uh, sacrifice or something? I, I didn't find it strange because I didn't really know when the story was supposed to take place. And I just remember that back in the 70s, uh, there was actually a real paranoia going on about, you know, Satanism and the Church of Satan by Anton LaVey and all that stuff. Mm. And some, not just in America, also in, in, in the UK, there were, I, I perfectly see some police officer thinking that there might be some Satanists, you know, doing yeah. something in Hyde Park. Well, and anything that oh, they no. don't understand, you know, that's a weird ritual yeah. they could call Satanism. Yeah. Yes, well, I, I think I said Hyde Park. Of course, it's Hampstead Heath. Um, it, uh, Hampstead Heath has always had a particular reputation as well um, over here. But, but you're absolutely right. Uh, in 1970, you know, our Sunday newspapers were filled with stories of Satanists and oh, yeah. children being, and and you're, you know, there was that paranoia about children being used in sacrifices. Or like and, Rosemary's Baby. Yeah, oh, that definitely speaks to um, uh, yeah. speaks to, to that. Is that um, everybody, all these normal people that are just going on in their lives are secretly, you know, part of this Satanist com conspiracy? Mm. Yeah, and yeah. No, it's interesting. Even, you pick up, you, you, pick up you, you pick up on these things because um, uh, when I, when I was sitting down to write, it was more I was more interested in. The passion, the desire, the, the sexuality of, the, of, of these things. Um, and well, of that's course, why you I, used a, a satyr, right? I mean, a satyr. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and also, yeah, no, absolutely. But also, the Satanism stuff comes in, of course, because I read Dennis Wheatley mm. when I was a kid. You know, I read every, De and I remember reading every Dennis Wheatley I could lay my hands yeah. on. Um, Devil's Ride Out to the Devil a Daughter and and so on. Um, that, 
that's always obviously been a great influence on me. Uh huh. And uh, I, I I was reading um, the Beast and Beauty, and I was getting all those glimpses of uh, the, the entity that was coming out of the egg. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking, okay, well, the first time I was reading, I was like, okay, well, is this going to be like they're mentioning Satanists, or is this going to be a demon or something? And then all of a sudden, the, I, I I read, you know, that he's knocking on the um, on the egg with his horns, and I'm like, hmm, this might be a demon. And then all of a sudden, I realize, oh, this is not about the devil at all. It's about Pan, you know. It's about uh, mm. so that. Yeah. that I think satyrs are fantastic creatures to use in fiction because they are the perfect combination between uh, man and beast. So, with uh, of course the uh, the the characteristic that they are very sexual, including in all the mm. uh, all the mythology, satyrs are always very sexual. I mean, even they can't even respect their best friend's wives. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> It's true because that's what happens with um, when um, I was trying to remember the uh, uh, that the the figure that goes into hell because she ate like some uh, Persephone. Um, yeah. Persephone, yes. So I mean, at her wedding, even the, the satyr tries to attack her, and uh, so um, very sexual. So that also gave the very sexual, sensual side to this story, um, especially because, of course. He gets to find this this lady, uh, this woman, who's very really attractive. She's she's continuously mentioned in the story as being you know beautiful and very famous, and her beauty pretty much defines her. Well, and, and, uh, and an interesting thing too is is uh, in Nightbreed, Lud is half satyr, right? His mother was human, and his father was a, a satyr. Right? He says, uh, when asked about his father, they ask if the devil had a hand in his making. He says, yes, and a dick too. So, <laughs> I, don't, I don't, I don't remember if the word satyr is used or it, if it's really just devil. Oh, I thought it was. But uh, anybody with the Nightbreed Chronicles out there, they can, they can check that. Mm. But uh, yeah, including his wife being a nun and him making her laugh so much that it, they crack the. The, the bell in the tower. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Lude is one of my favorite uh, night breeds as well. Uh, right next after Kinski, actually. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yes, yeah, satyrs are, and, and I particularly like the fact that at one point the lady looks at him and she says, "Oh, he's just wearing some brown trousers," and that's yeah. when you get the confirmation that it's a satyr because yeah. it's just like, you know, the lower part of the satyr is usually just like a goat. Yeah. So, yeah. Kind of goat. Yeah. And uh, yeah, uh, but, but the the opening the opening pages of the Beast and Beauty is almost like poetry. Oh yeah, it's like yeah. Uh, you get this 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 boy this guy this boy. Uh, I think he's meant to be nineteen, um, mm-hmm. and you just see him almost like dancing in the woods. Um, yeah. Of course, he's dancing to the sound yeah. of, of of the pan pipe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which is meant to seduce, like you know, like Hamelin's pipe or something like that. Yeah. So, uh, very beautiful, very poetic opening. Which at first I was like, uh, "Oh, please go on." No, no, no. You, you, you see, I think it's, and, and when I went back to the story uh, and rewrote some, of it and and that's, and I concentrated on that and sharpening it up and making it. Because I think I, what I really wanted to convey was that thing of um, there's a dreamlike quality mm. to that section of the story. As uh, you're being absolutely. hypnotized by the music. You're being hypnotized, but also drug-induced. <clears throat> uh, you know, uh, a drug-induced uh, thing. And it is about beauty. Um, and it, it, it's why it's called The Beast in Beauty. Um Rather than beating the beast, mm-hmm. um, it's it again. It's 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 about you know it's what it's about what monsters do. Um, who is the monster? Who's the who is the real monster in this story? Um, and about what we think of as monsters and, and, and yeah. So I think um, that poetry that was definitely what I was striving for. Um, yeah. Wanting to get the rhythm of the language 
Absolutely. Um, I was reading that out loud, actually. I was I was reading that out loud the first few pages because I was just trying to get the music of it, the musicality of it. And I was I, I read that those first few pages like a couple of times just to get into the uh, music because it, it, it sounds wonderful when you're saying it out loud. You just can't make it justice just by reading it in your mind. You need to speak it out loud and try to pronounce it. It, 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 it. Then you get oh, the that's, pace. Oh, that's interesting. That's very, very interesting. Because um, I've just been invited to a book club. Um, it's just five ladies who've been meeting for the last 18 months. Um, I just got the email through yesterday. Oh. Um, um, which I'm really looking forward to. It should be in January. I'm going across to England. Um, and just going, um, and they've said, you know, and I said, okay, well, you know, the way I see the evening work is I'll read something from the book. Um, before, and then we'll just do questions and answers. I'd not thought of reading that section out loud, but I'll have a look at that again. Mm. Um, oh, yes. Because it, certainly when I wrote it originally, and as I was saying, when I came back to it this time to have a look at it, it was very much along the lines of thinking of reading it out loud, hmm. um, but also getting the rhythm and the poetry of the language. Um, so, yeah, I'm reading that out loud. That sounds like a nice idea. I shall go and have a look at that again. Um, That's what I did. Um, cool. Excellent. That's what All made right. me uh, That's what made me get the pace of the, uh, of the story. Um, so, I have a quick question. So, uh, you said that Beast and Beauty is your favorite. Ryan, which is your yes. favorite story? Why? Uh, no, he said, he said Ryan... Oh, okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, right. I Go think on. it's either Beast and Beauty or Green Eyes. Right. Yeah. And I can't. Oh, I can't really decide. I think that I'd like to read Beast and Beauty again uh, to get a better sense of it. Right. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Okay. And there was definitely the story that I wanted to see more of. I wish the story was a little bigger. Was probably um, let me see. There was that happened to one of the stories. I'm trying to remember it because I um, I'm trying to get. Was it the worst uh, the worst day? Um, hang on. Let me just. Uh, it was worst day the shortest. Yeah. I think it was tunes from the music hall. Oh, okay. I mean, uh, no, it's 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 fine as it is. Uh, it's absolutely fine as it is. I'm just thinking that it it might have. I I just wish it was longer. I just wish it was longer because I was having so much fun with it. Um, oh, well, that's but, good because it's always good to leave want, people wanting more. Mm -hmm. And it's and yeah. it's always the, it's always the the difficulty with the thing about short stories. Um, as an art form, um, is that you've got you have to compress because yeah. um, you're not writing a novel. Um, the to actually keep it, you know, um, to True. sustain it, but also keeping it to such a length where, and what I aim to try and do is, there's enough in there that it. You, you said it yourself that it, it's you immediately thought of it in black and white. Good, I've succeeded because I've got you exactly where uh, I've got you into the atmosphere that I'm trying to, uh, yes. to conjure. Um, I'm glad you want it to be more. I wouldn't yeah. want to add more to it in that case. In, in, in that case, uh, if I've done well in that case from my from my point of view, if, if you want it to be. To, to hear more of the story and, and what yes, those characters yeah. and so on, then good. I'm satisfied that, that that's that's really worked. And also the worst day, because the worst day is, I think, one of the shortest stories. But but you give us all the information that we need to figure out the story. You make us work a little bit for it, which is wonderful. So I mean, uh, all the information is there. And uh, the uh, absolutely the, the twist is there, and we we get all of it. I just um, I just felt like just as I was starting to get into the story, it was over. 
And that was the only thing that I would say about the worst day. But apart from that, you know, no complaints. That's, that's interesting. That, that's the first one of the new ones that I wrote. Um, oh. uh, and that one came out of uh, going... Uh, when I left work, um, I was given a uh, week... Or a couple of days. I actually had a couple of days myself at a writer's retreat. Um, and that is the story that I wrote during that time. Um, it was it it was interesting, and, and, and you know, as I say, it's the first one. You know, the first new one. Um, the the stories I'm writing now for the second collection, I think, are going to be longer. Uh-huh. It's this. There seem to be more words coming out. Um, so it'll be interesting um, in these. There seem to be. Um, I don't know. Cause my immediate reaction is to go through with a big black pen and start taking out stuff. Um, whenever when it's part of, when when you're writing, and I think this is something that Ray Bradbury talks about as well. As you know, you write it, you put down words, you put down words. Um, and in fact, Simon Bamford, I was talking today when he was talking, to, you know, he was reporting a conversation he had had with Clive, is that um, if he writes ten pages, only one of them gets used. Hmm. Um, oh, yeah. And that's often, you know, that that is part of the creative process. But is particularly true when you're writing a short story, is that you want to make it spare, uh, as spare in, in terms or sparse. Um, in terms of what it is you're trying to do, in terms of your storytelling, but it's in, as I say, it is interesting. I'm finding it. I'm finding it interesting uh, from my perspective. In, in the new stories that I'm working on, it's probably why they're taking longer to write. Is because they are longer. Um, the first two that I've written, the first three, are, are definitely longer um, yeah. than the than the only ones. And this this new one that you mentioned. Uh for the followers of the Pandorix, yeah. is it going to be connected to the um, the box that is also being developed? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Wonderful. Um, yeah. So they. So um, and as I say, the, the first couple of pages is some of the most, for me personally, is some of the most disturbing <laughs> stuff that I've written. It's not gory. That's not the bit that's disturbing me. Um, oh, yeah. Um, so, and I shall leave that until, and I, that's what I'm going to say yeah. about that one. Well, and I think we can see that in some of these stories, too. Like, Green Eyes is, is more disturbing than gory. Mm. Yeah, and, 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 and that's kind of interesting, and that's always going to be interested. Um, uh, you, you don't, the stuff that I want to write or I'm interested in writing isn't always necessary. If I'm going to have gore in there, there's a reason. There's got to be a reason for it. Yeah. Um, I'm not averse to gore. I went. Um, I'll, I'll start wrapping up this because um, we've we've done our usual thing. We're now nearly talking for well over an hour. We've been <laughs> an hour and a half by the time we've finished. But I went. Uh, just been very fortunate recently to uh, attend some shows in the London Horror Festival. Uh, which is a series of fringe shows. Um, I've seen five uh, in the last couple of weeks, um, one of which is called Puppetry of the Flesh. Um, mm-hmm. There's no gore in that, but it has got an extremely disturbing puppet. Um, and it's... Um, and it was written by the guys who do the Hellraiser cast and uh, uh, Peter and Phil. Oh, yes. And it yeah. is, um, I think you guys have been in contact with. And yeah. the puppet that they have, it's only three foot tall, and it's in a very small fringe theatre. Um, you can see the two, you know, you know it's a person speaking, because you can see them, you know, it's like um, uh, the, 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 the Disney um, version of, um, oh gosh, The Lion movie. Oh, The Lion King. The Lion King. The Lion King, thank you. You can see the operators on stage, um, but you look at the puppet, and it's a very disturbing puppet. Huh. Uh, there's no gore in that, but it's very haunting. 
uh, and very disturbing. The other show that I went to see was called The Horror, The Horror. Now, this is done by a company called Theatre of the Damned. There is a lot of gore in that show. <laughs> yeah. Um, and again, it's very disturbing in a completely different way. Um, um, and people like it. Um, they're, they're doing a sellout. They're, they've got a few more. I think they've got to announce another couple of weeks to go. Uh, and they've sold out all their performances. Um, this is a company that does Grand Guignol. Um, and, and Disney shows. And they were behind putting on the London Horror uh, Festival. It's really nice to be able to go and see theatre horror. Um, oh, yeah. And, yeah. Um, unfortunately, I'm going to miss some of the shows because I'm away in Germany um, uh, next weekend. Um, I'm going to see some of the shows that I would really have liked to have seen. But having seen the horror, the horror, anybody who's lucky enough to go and see that show, you're, going to, you're in for a really interesting evening. Um, actually, it's only about an hour or so long, um, but that's enough. <laughs> yeah, that sounds wonderful. I mean, yeah. I don't know what it is about puppets that, that sometimes can be uh, endearing or, or disturbing, but I think the my earliest recollection of being disturbed by puppets was when I was watching movies by Jan Svankmeyer, which uh, he does animation with um, not just puppets, but also plasticine and clay and claymation. So right. Svankmeyer, he has this really disturbing version of Alice in Wonderland, which is just, I, I recommend it very thoroughly. He also oh, okay. has a Faust. And um, huh. uh, the Faust one relies heavily on puppets, and including like theater puppets, uh, the ones that, you know, are hanging from threads. Mm. So, marionettes. Yeah, marionettes. Yeah. So uh, they can be very, very disturbing. And, uh, you know, especially if they're... Because he, I guess it has to do with sometimes... The, what they call the uncanny valley. If a marionette is too close to a person, then you get this feeling where your brain kind of starts thinking, well, this looks like a person, but it's really not. So you get this strange sensation, uh, a strange reaction, like uh, yeah. this is not... And, uh, you know, and if it's, you know, marionettes are just... Uh, I guess it's like people who don't like clowns. I mean, you yeah. can also... Yeah. Get some, yeah some kind of reaction that's like fight or flight yeah. when you see yeah. like but um, another disturbing puppet yeah. movie uh have you seen uh, peter jackson's meet the feebles <laughs> yeah i haven't <laughs> no uh that's that's like the the muppet show on acid yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> I, I always thought on 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 the the fellowship of the ring they should have put that on the on the movie poster from the from the man who brought you meet the feebles yeah. Right, 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 or bad taste. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I remember seeing that when it first came out. Um, yeah. Anyway, I I need to have some dinner. Ah, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, sorry we've kept you so long. No, that's quite all right. It's my pleasure. It's, it's always a joy to talk to, talk to you guys. Yeah, we, we really um, enjoy talking to you. Definitely. And uh, there you go. So uh, uh, what monsters do? By Nicholas Vince, uh, edited by Maria Regan, who you might rec recognize from The Hellbound Hearts. She also edited that with Paul Kane. And uh, there's another book for, by Paul Kane coming out this month, I think, uh, or November. Um, which they've is just done crazy. Body Horror. Um, it's a collection that's just, which they did recently. That's out at the moment. <laughs> But right. I think they may well have another one coming out as well. There is another one called Hellraisers, which is going to be interviewing with the cast of Hellraiser, right? I mean, um, it's supposed to come out, I think, in November, late November. It's going to be called Hellraisers by Paul Kane. So that's oh, right. going to be. Mm. Yeah. So and are, are, oh, that, oh, I was wondering, oh, gosh, I had, oh, it comes, one gets so lost in these things. Um, and uh, Paul and Marie have, have been moving house recently, so I've not spoken. To, and, of course, I missed them at because um, uh, I was in Lexington. I missed the British Fantasy Con, um, where I would have, probably would have picked up on all this stuff. I remember Paul doing an interview with me uh, for that, oh, gosh, two, three years ago. Yeah, um, a long time in the making. So yeah, yeah, 
Oh, good. Oh, I'm glad that's coming out. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, we call them lasers. But, you know, now we're talking about your, your book. So What Monsters Do, it's on Amazon and iBooks. Mm-hmm. So there's plenty of places where you can uh, uh, purchase the book. I thoroughly recommend yeah, it. I really yeah, enjoyed definitely. it. Uh, short stories. It is not our flesh that makes us monsters. It is our acts. So thank you for being with yeah. us. My pleasure, guys, as always. All right. So, Good night. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Enjoy your dinner. Yeah. And all my best. For me, it's and looking 11.30 a.m. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Good night. Good morning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's all the same. Yeah. <laughs> All right, then. Thank you. Uh, we'll to having you, you soon. Uh, and I'll look up that. I'll look up the werewolf movie oh, yeah. that I'm. Um, I'm. Oh, why can't I remember the name of it? Um, it's just been out recently. I will look that up and I will come back to you with it. Okay.